would like to welcome everybody to today's event, uh, the name of which is Putin's Russia, Recent Domestic Developments and the Challenged Regional Security. We have two distinguished guests today at Indiana State University, David Kramer and Catherine Stoner. And the whole event is taking place, so to say, at the sidelines of the Leadership Academy, organized by Stanford Center on uh, Democracy Development, the Rule of Law, and EPRC, our own already long-term partner of Indiana State University. Um, and I would like to say a couple of words about each of our guests and then give floor to, uh, give floor to them. Uh, David Kramer is uh, currently um, Senior Director for the Human Rights and Democracy at McCain Institute and um, he has been uh, uh, working for uh, US Department of State, German Marshall Fund, he was the President of Freedom House for four years and um, also teaching uh, um, for example, at the Elliott School for International Affairs at George Washington um, University, and is known to be one of the uh, best specialists in um, uh, Russian immigration affairs. Um, whereas Catherine Stoner is a senior fellow at Stanford University, uh, Center for Democracy um, Development and the Rule of Law. Um, uh, she has been um, uh, prior to coming to Stanford, she was on the faculty of Princeton University and also teaching at Columbia and McGill Universities. Um, she, uh, her publications include two books, uh, Resisting the State, Reform and Retrenchment in Post-Soviet Russia, as well as Local Heroes, the Political Economy of Russian Region Governments, and she has co-edited with uh, Michael McFall, uh, the collection of articles after the collapse of communism compared to the lessons of transitions. Um, uh, we, I'm sure that every one of us is really very deeply, sometimes very personally interested in the topic of Putin's Russia because it uh, presents a great challenge to the region and to Georgia in particular. So we are very, um, all very uh, looking forward to the, uh, today's um, session. Uh, after the presentations, we'll have the possibility to ask questions. So first, uh, I would like to ask, to present Catherine Stoller about the domestic developments, uh, the recent development developments in Russia. Thank you very much for having, uh, having us here and um, thank you all for coming. I understand it's your exam period, so particularly appreciate you taking time out from studying for exams to, uh, to have us entertain you. Um, so I've actually just come from a week in Moscow and I, I was reminded how much I like Georgia when I came, <laughs> coming directly from Moscow. Um, the weather last week was particularly bad um, in Russia, you'll be happy to hear probably. And uh, it's so much, so much nicer uh, to here to not have to wear winter boots. So, um, but thank you for your hospitality uh, as well. So I'll talk a little bit about um, Vladimir Putin's attempts to resurrect Russia as, as he calls it, the great power. Um, and uh, hopefully you'll tell me if I'm speaking too quickly, maybe just by raising a hand if you think I've, I'm too fast. That's my, one of my biggest problems, I think, speaking. Um, I want to start before I start moving through the slides, though, um, with the quote that uh, with, has been attributed to Winston Churchill about Russia, which is, and there are many quotes, of course, about Russia, and we'll get to some others, but one is, Russia is never as weak as it seems, nor as strong as it seems. And he was in particular talking about the Russian army during World War II. Um, but Vladimir Putin has used it um, several times um, to talk about Russia as a country. Um, and he's using it more in a way, I think, to warn all of us that even when we're down here in Russia, we're not out. Um, and so I'm going to look a little bit at this myth that, of resurrection and see whether or not it is in fact a myth. We of course know that Russia is going through some very difficult economic times now, which I'll talk about as well by the end here of my comments. Um, and then uh, hopefully I'll get to the implications of uh, the, what's going on uh, in Russia politically and economically, uh, implications for Georgia and, and also for the rest of the world. Um, so another, another great quote about Russia, of course, is another uh, one that is uh, uh, that it's an enigma wrapped 
um, you know, mystery full of contrasts and contradictions, and I think that's still very much um, the case. People wonder, do we count it as a developed or still a developing country? It has attributes of both, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, is it a re-emerging great power, as its leadership asserts, or is it merely a regional bully, uh, grabbing land from Georgia, of course, and from Ukraine uh, even more recently, and even from Moldova? Um, so here are some of the contrasts and contradictions. Russia is considered an upper middle income country. That's a strange term. It's not mine. Uh, you can blame that on the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. It's an upper middle income country um, with an adult mor male mortality rate um, uh, that is about the same as Botswana's uh, in Africa. So it's a strange contrast. High income yet um, clear health issues. Um, and human capital issues. It's, of course, a nuclear superpower. Mr. Putin has made sure that we get to hear more and more about the importance of Russia being a nuclear um, power. But it has human development, measure, me human development measures slightly below Libya, if you look at the uh, Human Development Index um, by the World Bank. Um, it's an emerging economy, but with 2.98% uh, share of um, the global economy. It's actually now lower uh, if you um, calculated it now. This is from over a month ago. Uh, it would be down um, to about a 1.69% share of the global economy. So really quite small, not exactly an economic superpower built to the rest of the world, but probably to Georgia feels like an economic superpower because it's so big and it's sitting so close to your borders, of course. Um, and um, it's, of course, not a communist country anymore, but it is a it is in no way a democracy uh, anymore either. Elections don't decide the distribution of power. There's strict controls, and increasingly strict controls over the media and now uh, over the internet as well. Um, strict controls over freedom of assembly and uh, extreme suspicion and control over non-governmental organizations as well. So um, it's not, as one of my friends said, uh, it, it's in, in Russia, it's not um, quite Kazakhstan. Um, Putin is not Nazarbayev, he's not erecting statues uh, to himself, um, perhaps yet. Um, he likened him to Darth Vader. There's good in him, deep down. Uh, so I'm not sure that you can say there's good necessarily, but there's a softer form of authoritarianism than there is certainly in, in other parts of the world, in particular Central Asia. Um, so what are the evidence of, well, in this group I don't think I really have to make much of this slide. What's the, what are the, what's the evidence of Mr. Putin's neo-imperial dreams, I've called them. And we can talk perhaps about whether or not there is a neo-imperialism or merely just a reassertion of interests in reaction to um, NATO expansion in particular and EU expansion. Um, but here's some quotes from uh, Mr. Putin through the years. Um, the, the most infamous perhaps, and in, in, in part kind of misunderstood, the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 21st century. Um, I don't think that necessarily implies that he's trying to rebuild the Soviet Union, but I'm happy to talk about that later. Here he is talking to George H. Bush, that is George W. Bush's father, when he was um, president, or actually after, it, it's George, yeah, George H. W. Bush, um, saying, you don't understand, George, that Ukraine is not even a state. What is Ukraine? Part of its territory, is Eastern Europe, but the greater part is a gift from us. And at last, Russia has been, more recently 2012, at last Russia has returned to the world arena as a strong state, a country that others heed and it can stand up for itself. And um, here is something he purportedly said uh, just after grabbing Crimea and when we were all worried that he would go even further into Ukraine. If I wanted to, I could take Kiev in two weeks. He actually denies saying that, but I don't think Jose Manuel Goroso would necessarily lie about that. Um, so is Russia's resurrection real or imagined? I think um, it, it is real in the minds of uh, Russia's leadership, many in Russia's leadership, Mr. Putin, chief among Russia's leaders. How can we tell? Well, we'll look at economic and military um, metrics. I have to actually have a wider book on this, looking at uh, military metrics, economic metrics, and also social um, metrics, which are much more mixed on Russia's resurrection. And what are the implications uh, for uh, its neighbors? Well, first, has Putin resurrected Russia? 
Um, I thought I would just remind you of this guy, um, Mikhail Gorbachev, still alive, of course, and, and kicking. Um, uh, saying November 8th, 2014, getting slightly hysterical, perhaps, that the world is on the brink of a new Cold War, and some are even saying that it has begun. I think that's slightly extreme. The Cold War was a very specific set of circumstances with dueling ideologies, um, dueling economic systems, dueling political systems. We don't think we're there yet. We, uh, Russia is much more engaged in the international economy than the Soviet Union ever was, and certainly we're still talking to one another. That said, relations between Russia and the West um, and between Russia and many, many, perhaps even the majority of its immediate neighbors, is very bad. Um, this is a, a sort of rough slide that I think is coming out of The Economist um, that just shows that, in, in fact, if you look carefully at some key indicators on Russia, it, it's nowhere near China, um, the European Union as a bloc, uh, the United States, in terms of um, GDP, in terms of military power, um, in, in terms of its percentage of its military expenditure, um, and um, human development in particular. This last measure I don't think is terribly useful, it, but it does show you that uh, the Russian military is um, not as experienced in combat deaths in the last 15 years as unfortunately the U.S. is, uh, but neither is China. But in these first three measures, which I think are more telling and interesting and more significant, uh, you can clearly see Russia is, for all of its aspirations and rhetoric, nowhere near um, these other great economic and military powers in the world. But we'll see if that matters. Um, here's something I'm sure you're all very familiar with. This is just GDP growth in Eastern Europe in the last 10 years or so. Um, Russia's the big, as it so often is, big thick red line, and you can see the others um, arrayed across the bottom. The important thing is it's really in the middle um, in terms of economic growth as a percentage of GDP per capita. And the important thing, too, I think here to note is that it's, of course, um, an oil-based economy, right? Um, no need to remind you guys of that. Um, and you can see that growth is really picking up 2008 or nine when oil prices, of course, go way up. If we extended this out to 2015, well, imagine my pen <laughs> taking it down to zero yeah. <laughs> and into negative ter territory um, in 2015 and now uh, into uh, 2016, it's anticipated. Um, growth will be somewhere around negative 0.8 to negative 3% um, GDP. Um, the more optimistic forecast is from the Ministry of the Economy in Russia, and the pessimistic forecasts are from international agencies like the World Bank. So very dependent on oil prices, of course. Here's some other social indicators. So when we think of a great power, we generally don't think of it as one, as a country that is weak in terms of human development, right? So. Um, as I mentioned earlier, mortality, which is the death rate, is roughly equivalent to a country like Botswana. Life expectancy, although it's recovered significantly uh, in Russia in the last four or five years in particular, um, is 68 years, uh, which is lower than uh, Bangladesh in 2014, a country that has about a third of Russia's GDP per capita. So not really investing heavily in, in um, human capital in terms of um, of human welfare. Male life expectancy is particularly striking. It's back where it was in about 1990 um, in Russia. But when you consider the rather rapid increase and tremendous increase in GDP per capita and disposable income, in particular from 2004 or 5 onward, it's still shocking that life expectancy is 63 years old for men uh, as compared to almost 80 years old in the United States. Um, and 80 in the United Kingdom, and women 74.8. So it's ranks 112th in the world of, out of about 180 countries. So not at all in line with where you would expect it to be as a middle-income country. Um, and that has long-term implications for the labor force and the productivity of labor over time. So it's going to have a long-term destabilizing impact on the Russian economy. Um, if you don't have growth in population and you don't have in-migration in, in particular, a lot of development economics says that you don't have a bubbling of innovation and new ideas. So regardless of anything else the state does, the fact that the um, population isn't doing well in terms of you know, deaths exceeding births again, 
and we're getting negative population growth. We're not getting new um, in migration uh, of people with skills. Um, then uh, it risks innovation and further development. Um, life expectancy is, as I said, stayed about the same since 1970. The leading causes of death are preventable diseases. This is true in much of uh, the world, actually. In, in the United States, for example, uh, cardiovascular disease is also the leading, leading cause of death. It's due to obesity, primarily. Americans eat far too much sugar, in particular. Um, I'm Canadian, so I can freely say that. Um, but people tend to die later uh, in the United States than they do in Russia. And that's the real issue here, is that people are dying in Russia um, or becoming sick at the peak of their productive period in life. So um, long term, this is a very, very bad trend. Um, they're the heaviest smokers in the world, um, but I actually have a project on Russian tobacco policy. and. Um, the, uh, we don't know yet whether the rate of smoking has gone down in the last two years since the implementation of this policy or the beginning of the implementation of the ban on smoking in public places. Um, but it, theoretically it should. Um, but um, it is per capita uh, kind of one of the two highest smoking countries in the world. Uh, relatively highly educated population, so that's more on the plus side. But again, there's been underinvestment in education, so if we think of long-term economic growth, um, there hasn't been enough investment in education. One of the things Mr. Putin has said repeatedly is that he admires the model of South Korea, um, where, of course, first they were authoritarian in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and took off economically um, with state-initiated uh, growth um, and investment in enterprises, and then liberalized and uh, now is, is doing quite well as a democracy with a relatively high GDP per capita. The thing is, South Korea, like India, now, um, and China, has invested in education and in health and human services in a way that Russia has simply not. Um, so he may admire South Korea, but he's not at all following the South Korean uh, development model. Um, I'll note also, of course, South Korea was not an economy that is dependent on revenues from hydrocarbon exports and, and taxes, as Russia's is. So although a relatively highly educated population, um, relatively speaking, the labor force is more expensive um, than uh, other um, parts of the world uh, where international companies might go for services, like, for example, India. Okay, so growth, but in decline, and again, if, if we extended this out, sorry, this was done in December, all the way to December to, to 2015, we begin to see um, growth slip below zero. And in 2016, as I mentioned, we're expecting it to hit somewhere between one and maybe even negative um, three uh, percent of GDP. So clearly back in uh, recession in a way that it was not, uh, has not been since the 1990s. So not news to you, of course, you probably no, no that. Okay, so oil and, and gas exports, and this is um, sort of a confluence of factors, I guess, that is currently slamming the Russian um, economy, extremely destabilizing, um, and perhaps responsible for some of uh, the foreign policy decisions that have been made lately uh, on the part of the Russian government. Um, so uh, obviously the largest company, uh, country in the world geographically, until recently, was the fifth largest economy, I believe it's now slipped to about eighth place. Um, technically 141 million people, maybe 142, um, but Mr. Putin likes to say it's closer to 146 um, or 145 point something because he counts Crimean and the Crimean population uh, now as part of Russia. Um, it does, however, have negative or if you're charitable, flat population growth. So um, starting again to get a higher death rate than birth rate for the long term development, that's going to have uh, a negative impact on the labor force for the next 10 to 15 to 20 years. So this isn't something that's just a problem now, it's a problem long term for Russia as well. Um, and we can, if you're interested, talk about things that they've done to try to ameliorate that and get women to have more children or to attract people back. Nothing so far has been um, particularly successful in that regard. Um, at purchasing power parity, it's uh, dropped, um, of course, uh, considerably. It's now about, uh, about two-thirds of that 23,000 just in the last six or so months. Um, but I'm using full 
figures from the most recent year that has full figures. Um, of course, the Russian economy is primarily um, commodity driven, not just oil and gas. Of course, it has non ferrous metals, and it's become quite um, uh, a formidable wheat exporter now, which is, a, is a, a new thing. So there have been improvements in certain sectors of the Russian economy, but nonetheless, as I'm sure you well know, um, the economy was not diversified um, in good times. Um, formidable reserve fund um, was created, uh, which has cushioned some of the ruble in particular uh, since 2008 and, and the economic, uh, global uh, economic slowdown. Um, but it has not been used so much to do that in the last few months. Um, and so we have an exchange rate that's bumping up almost to 80 uh, rubles per dollar in the last few days. Um, the energy sector in Russia is con continues to be a large part of government revenue, and obviously this is hugely problematic. Um, it's hit the government's revenues even worse. That is the drop in oil prices has hit the government's revenues even worse than it has hit um, the revenues of oil companies because of um, the fact that the way taxes are calculated on oil sales in particular, um, they go down uh, as um, a price of a, a, a barrel of oil um, goes down, but it goes down, they go down further, so it's not directly proportionate to um, the price. So it's become very problematic for the Russian government in terms of budgetary um, revenue. It's at least 40% now, and so dropping. So what has happened uh, in the last week in particular is that as oil prices have dipped down into the low $30 per barrel of uh, oil, actually I think it was $28 or $29 um, today, um, that Russia has had to go back and revise its budgetary figures. They the, the order has been given to sequester, that is cut 10% um, of the budget. Um, and if they're able to do that, then they will maintain a 3% budget deficit. Um, but that is calculating oil at $40 a barrel on average um, throughout 2016. And that, that's kind of a rosy estimate um, at this point. At least that's the way it looks on January 18th, um, 2018. So um, very problematic. Where will those cuts hit the hardest? Um, probably in terms of social services, social welfare. One area that I know Mr. Putin would not want um, to come up too short on is pensions. Um, so far, they have been able to keep pensions indexed to inflation. Inflation um, is uh, estimated by the World Bank to be somewhere between 12 and 14 percent, by the Ministry of the uh, Economy in Russia, lower, 8 to 10 percent. Um, but um, pensioners tend to vote. And it's very hard to shoot Babushka or arrest Babushki uh, in the square, of course, if they turn up and say, my pension's too low. Um, so um, I think the one area, the one uh, fund that will not be rated to try and uh, cover other debts would be, the, would be the pension fund. So that leaves um, the sovereign wealth fund um, really is the, is the only fund um, still to be able to support um, debts in the economy or provide uh, investment capital. Obviously, uh, investment has gone down um, since the imposition of uh, sanctions as well and access to global ca capital. So here's just Russia's share of global GDP. And again, it's just to show even in good times, right? So if we take uh, rapid growth starting in, well, it starts as early as 1999, but really takes off uh, purportedly in um, 2004, 2005, as oil prices go up, that line is pretty flat, that red line is pretty flat. So even though in, in Russian terms, um, the economy is growing on average, uh, you know, seven to eight percent year on year between 2000 and 2008, it's still a very, very small part of the global economy. So if you think of a great power and the resurrection of a great power, you would, you would think that it would have a greater share of the global economy, right? Um, and it doesn't. Um, the growth has been of a certain type, tremendous inequality um, in Russia. And if you looked at the Gini coefficient um, for estimate for 2015, which is coming out now, um, it, it, Gini's go from uh, zero to, to one. Um, the higher the number, the more unequal um, the country. So um, uh, the closer to zero, zero is perfectly equal. Russia is moving up toward a 0.41 um, Gini coefficient. 
um, and, uh, and it's getting worse. Um, so it's not the most unequal country in the world. What would Georgia's be? Do you, does anyone know? The, what do you think it is? You think it's 40, right. So, so uh, Russia would be a little more unequal than Georgia then. Um, but um, the, uh, the thing that has happened at the same time um, as um, Russia became wealthier, freedom declined. Now we have declining growth and declining uh, measures of freedom, um, if you take the estimate of Freedom House where David was president. Okay, growth for the few again, this is just showing inequality. Um, and um, this is uh, essentially talking about what is Putinism, is it a model um, of development in, in the way that South Korea may have had a model. Well, it's basically crony capitalism. It is not state-led capitalism. There is that element for sure. Certainly the state has a very large role in the Russian economy, um, either directly uh, through ownership or indirectly by um, placing government officials in uh, key spots um, and by blurring lines between business and government. Um, it has uh, extreme inequality, as I mentioned, low investment in human capital, um, health and education, low investment in infrastructural capital, even in the oil and gas industries. And now, because of um, sanctions imposed by the United States and the European Union, uh, more, much more limited um, access to international capital as well. So that will presumably drive Russia further into debt. They can afford that for the next year or two, but um, in, in Moscow, the, in Yigar, the Gaidar Forum last week, uh, this was a huge concern, um, is how will we finance this? And so the rumors are of tremendous instability in the next year to two years and the, the uh, near certainty that if oil prices don't increase, Russia will, to try to cover some of its debts, run through the sovereign wealth fund. And then we'll have big trouble at the end of 2017. As of course, very weak rule of law and uncertain property rights, and this discourages foreign direct investment it's also encouraging capital flight out of the country um, as well. So while we think of Putin generally as a very strong leader um, who, to whom elites listen, um, if you look at where their money goes, they're not listening to him. Um, they're sending their money still out of the country more than they're keeping it in the country because they don't, they don't trust the economy and they don't trust property rights guarantees. All right, so obviously, um, Democracy has been undermined really since um, 2000, um, such that there really is no democracy uh, at all. Um, the perception of uh, the relationship between state and society in Russia, I think, is fundamentally different than in Georgia, but you'll correct me if I'm wrong. Um, or maybe if we think of it on a spectrum, perhaps. Um, in, in Russia, the perception is that society works for the state. The state is paramount, and society is in service to the state. Um, and um, uh, therefore, private interests um, trump the public interest in terms of elite interests, corruption flourishes, um, and participation in politics is suspicious. Um, the uh, media is uh, weak, um, and uh, there's selective rule of law. The media is largely controlled, of course, by the state as well. All opposition is viewed as subversive or disloyal. Um, there's an uh, extreme and increasing personalization of power. Some of you may have enjoyed the um, videos and uh, laudatory uh, films about Mr. Putin when he turned 63 in October. You may have seen the fabulous hockey game that he played. Did you see? He's, he's, he scored 11 goals and wore number 11. Um, but he allowed Sergei Shoigu, the Minister of Defense, to score a goal too, so that tells you where he stands um, in Putin's estimation. Um, so very weak accountability. Um, elections are not completely meaningless, but pretty close to completely meaningless. Um, the economic growth that we saw in 2000 and 2008 has largely become stifled as uh, the uh, system has consolidated. Um, low domestic and foreign investment continues. It's down a further 5% are the estimates um, in Vietnam State for 2016. Um, again, um, partly this is because of the weak legal regime, um, because success in business and market is subject to administrative fiat. One of my friends in Moscow said, you know, if you build a business that's worth less than $250 million, you're safe. They're not interested in that. Um, so there's that sweet spot of $249 million, um, I guess, 
in terms of property rights. It's a low innovation um, economy, in part because there seems to be a fear in, in the business community that your business can be taken from you arbitrarily. Um, it's rule by law as opposed to rule of law, using law against uh, interests that um, may be subversive to the state or opposed to the state or simply successful um, in, in business. There aren't a lot of Googles um, or Apples or um, Facebooks, although there was the Contactian and the government corrected, it, uh, basically. Um, there is Yandex. Um, there um, is certainly potential, um, but uh, Russia is not an innovation economy. It's not even an imitation economy in the way that China's is. Um, so again, China doesn't have the population problems. It doesn't have um, the human capital problems and development of population um, that Russia has, um, and uh, much, much bigger population. Uh, so it can at least imitate. In some cases, it can innovate even, and it's a huge market. Russia has none of that, um, and it's not coming down the pipeline. It's not imminent. It's not about to happen. Um, so there was an opportunity blown to diversify the economy, to invest. Um, in human capital, in education, in health, um, and um, that op opportunity was not taken. Um, and I think we've seen some of Putin's lieutenants even referring to Russia's economy as going backwards rather than forwards. Um, so what's the likely outcome for the next um, five years? Well, I have friends in, in Russia who are um, uh, economists and sociologists and political scientists and you get ranges from, it's going to be a very bad two years, to in one year, Putin will be dead and this regime is over. Um, that seems extreme um, to me, um, but certainly Russia is um, heading away from economic development in the long term. Um, this is different than 1998. It's even different than 2008 um, in that there is a, there is a, a market uh, for uh, the main commodity that Russia purveys, uh, oil, that is not coming back strong anytime soon. They will not again see $120, $130 barrel oil prices in the next five years. That won't happen. Iran is going to gradually come on and sell even more oil. The Saudis are quite determined um, to keep the price low, and um, the U.S. is becoming more self-sufficient and now even beginning to export um, oil abroad. So. Um, as I said, Russia is missed opportunities. Um, okay. This is uh, something I just wanted to sort of introduce into our discussion, and that is um, why then, when the Russian economy is um, clearly going downhill, and the problems began in 2012, 2013, um, why then have foreign adventures? And I'll end in just a moment, and, and David can take over on this. Um, why grab Crimea after spending $50 billion on the Sochi um, Olympics and squander whatever public, uh, international public approval and public favor uh, came from the Sochi Olympics? Why get involved um, in Syria? Um, why uh, stir up more trouble uh, in eastern Ukraine and then stop? Why incur these sanctions at a time when you can least afford it? And I think the simple answer is, first of all, Crimea was reactive. Um, it was, uh, uh, Putin has this perception of uh, being under siege by the West in particular. And as you know, uh, uh, the taking parts of Georgia, the two regions of Georgia in 2008 was uh, uh, perhaps an initial volley uh, in trying to protect Russia from NATO incursion. Now NATO cannot come to Georgia because we have Russian troops um, in, in these two territories. Um, it could, could be that. Um, I think he was very determined not to have NATO in the, the Black Sea in a, in a permanent way. Um, and so, uh, and very afraid also that the new Ukrainian government after Maidan would cancel the leases uh, on um, the ports uh, that Russia had, military, or maybe naval ports Russia had for the Black Sea fleet. So you can see that as, as potentially defensive. There is also an argument that if you look, uh, it didn't come up that well here, but if you look month by month, here, year by year, here is here are his approval ratings um, just the month before in February of 2014, before he, um, a little green man appeared in Crimea, um, and here are his approval ratings going up significantly uh, a month later. So um, a, a, a kind of popular story with, or narrative, 
um, from Russian analysts is that it's very difficult to govern Russia um, given how weakly institutionalized its political system is and how dependent it has become on Mr. Putin personally, it's very difficult for him to govern with a less than 70% approval rate. So if he doesn't get 70% uh, or you know, 68%, it, he's almost dead. Um, now that's an approval rating that most American presidents or Canadian prime ministers or British prime ministers would die for. Um, but um, he, because uh, he doesn't have a party to fall back on, um, he really has to keep it high. So you could, if you were particularly cynical, say, well, he knew Crimea would be popular. I'm not sure if he knew it would be popular, but he certainly knew there was little NATO could do about it, um, or would do about it. I don't think he anticipated the sanctions necessarily, or, and the fact that the sanctions came at a time when oil prices dropped um, was perhaps by chance. Um, but um, the sanctions and the fact that the Europeans have stuck with the sanctions with the United States, I think have actually been quite effective and have hit Russia at a time that, um, as we've mentioned, as I've mentioned, the oil markets, of course, crashed too. Okay, so what's gonna happen? Well, certainly this year and next year are absolutely critical for Russia in a number of respects. In September of 2016, there will be Duma elections, and although elections don't exactly decide the distribution of power in Russia, it's important for uh, Mr. Putin's party of choice, United Russia, to look strong um, and to look as though it's in control. And he's always governed with a compliant Duma. Um, there isn't really a strong opposition, of course. Opposition forces have been largely annihilated. Um, so he probably will, but not getting numbers over 50% would be a loss for United Russia. Not having turnout that makes the uh, election look legitimate would be a loss. Uh, for Mr. Putin personally and, of course, for United Russia. Um, 2017 is also a critical year because if Russia's economy does not begin to recover and if debts continue to be paid out of the sovereign wealth fund um, and Russia doesn't have access to international capital markets, it will run through the sovereign wealth fund. It will not have that anymore. And they will begin to run very, very large um, budget deficits and, debt and, and get into a lot of debt. The question is, who lends the money? China has not invested in Russia in the way Mr. Putin clearly anticipated and hoped. They've sat on the sidelines, and after all, the Chinese economy itself is in trouble relative to where it was five years ago. So there's a real lack of alternatives here. It's, it's not at all clear where any extra help will come from. So um, Russia is increasingly isolated internationally because of the foreign policy, which in part may have been driven by uh, domestic needs. Um, and the isolation has further hit its economy. Um, but it still punches, as they say, above its weight, right? There is a legacy effect here in terms of the domain of its power, that is the geographical reach of Russian influence. Um, and you here in Georgia feel that perhaps most of all, as, as do the Ukrainians. Um, and also the scope of its interests. So Russia is involved in many, many different things and deals with different countries on a range of different issues, not just economic, um, but also energy in terms of the Arctic, exploration of the Arctic, um, and uh, international security. So it can still play a very important global role, even if it's not a great power, um, even if it's merely a regional bully. Um, it's, of course, a destabilizing power, um, and it cannot be ignored. Um, and I think the United States became, in particular, became very distracted by the Middle East and forgot that there is another huge country geographically, um, other than China, that can actually influence and is much more willing to influence international affairs than China is. Um, Syria obviously was a surprise um, to the United States and that Russia was able to mobilize so quickly. So when we think of Russian power and the exercise of Russian power, um, its military is actually an area of um, very uh, effective reform. Since 2008, it didn't particularly look good here in Georgia. It didn't uh, comport itself particularly well. There has, perhaps unfortunately now for Georgia and Ukraine, been pretty significant military reform, and Russia has a lot of new toys um, to show off and some new capabilities um, to show off as well. Um, so.
Um, the bottom line is that the news in Russia, the weather last week was very dreary, and all of the news was dreary too. Uh, Russia's becoming increasingly uh, unstable. Um, it's unstable, yet it has uh, considerable military ability, considerable coercive ability, and it has proven itself to be uh, quite capable and interested in using it uh, when it needs to. Um, so I think all of this, Russia's weakness uh, economically, um, has begun to destabilize it politically and made it more aggressive, not less aggressive. You might expect that as the economy declines, it would retract internationally, but instead what we see is it becoming more aggressive. Um, so I'd be interested in hearing from you what you think that means um, for Georgia um, and whether that makes Georgia nervous, um, increasingly nervous, or, or whether you think that the system is just stable uh, as it is right now and Russia won't come further in um, to Georgia. But thank you very much. David, we'll take it out for Thank you very much, Catherine. Thanks very much for that. Thank you to the university. It's great to be here and to see such a terrific turnout of, of people. Um, I actually want to pick up on your last point, Catherine. I want to take a survey of this audience. How many of you view Putin's Russia as an existential threat to Georgia? Okay. An interesting debate was launched last summer in the United States when several senior US military officials used that exact phrase in describing Putin's Russia. In fact, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the most senior military official in the United States, referred to Russia as an existential threat to the United States. And that characterization was based not solely on Russia's nuclear weapons capability, but on a demonstration of a willingness to use force, of course, going back even before 2008 to 2007 with a cyber attack against Estonia, of course, 2008 against your country, and then more recently, 2014 to the present day against Ukraine, uh, including Crimea. I think, inarguably, Putin oversees one of the most corrupt authoritarian regimes in the world. It's not perhaps the most authoritarian. North Korea, of course, is. China, actually, is known for worse human rights abuses than Russia. But the combination of this kleptocratic system is, I would argue, a major threat, not just to you, but to all of us who represent the democratic community of nations. We share, we in the United States, you, Georgia, really share, I would argue, few common interests. Forget values. We certainly don't share values with Putin's Russia. I would argue we don't even share many common interests, despite the fact that the Secretary of State for the United States continues to meet with his Russian counterpart and with President Putin. Putin represents a threat, first and foremost, to his own people through a brutal, ruthless crackdown against human rights, against dissidents, against opposition figures, as Catherine was describing. Anyone who speaks out against the Kremlin is described as an enemy of the state, as a part of the fifth column. They demonize the opposition and put their lives in danger. And in the case of Boris Nemtsov, quite literally, who was killed almost a year ago today. It's a threat, of course, to its neighbors. I don't need to explain this characterization of Russia as a threat. You know this all too well. Ukrainians have experienced it more recently, including with the annexation of Crimea, the first illegal annexation of one European country by another since World War II. It's not the first invasion, it's the first annexation since World War II. Russia engages in trade cutoffs, energy cutoffs. It uses energy as a political weapon. It establishes frozen conflicts among a number of the neighboring states in order both to destabilize them and to make them unappealing to Western institutions, including to NATO, so that NATO might believe that Georgia, for example, is indefensible, or because it doesn't have full control over its territory, could never become a member of NATO. It does the same thing with Ukraine. By establishing control over Crimea, Russia tries to establish facts by saying Ukraine is indefensible and not in full control of its territory. We've seen threats by Russian officials, including Mr. Putin, 
of using nuclear weapons, something we actually had not seen from Soviet leaders. We see flyovers of neighboring states, including NATO member states, where Russian aircraft turn off their transponders, risking serious confrontation and conflict, perhaps accidental, perhaps not. All of these things represent a threat, I would argue. Of course, Ukraine, where we see uh, Mr. Putin representing a threat to Ukraine because, and uh, picking up on what Catherine said, Ukraine in 2013 was on the verge of signing agreements with the European Union. It used to be NATO that had been held up as the threat to Russia, but it had become the European Union that was the new threat. Countries in the region joining Euro-Atlantic institutions, meaning to Putin losing grip over their control, luring neighbors to the Euro-Atlantic institutions, representing an alternative to the model that Putin had established in Russia. For Putin, that was a threat, and Ukraine was the biggest threat possible, moving closer to the West. He sees any efforts by any neighboring states, including your own, to democratize, to liberalize, as a threat to his model of, of control, to his grip on power. And anything that he views as a threat is something he will deal with rather brutally. He adopts a very zero-sum approach to the region and establishes spheres of influence that we in the West have to be careful not to buy into. So what to do about this? First and foremost, we need to do more to support your country, to support Ukraine, to support Moldova. Some of the other countries in the region make it a little more difficult for us to help. Azerbaijan, not far away, is engaging in the worst crackdown in human rights in its uh, independent history. We need to provide lethal military assistance to Ukraine. And here, I think, my president has made a terrible mistake in denying Ukraine the means to help defend itself. Ukraine has not asked for American soldiers to be on the ground. It has asked for anti-tank missiles and other means by which to repel further Russian aggression. The United States, I would argue, under the 1994 Budapest Memorandum, in which Ukraine relinquished its nuclear weapons in exchange for guarantees of its sovereignty and territorial integrity from Russia, the United Kingdom, and the United States, we have an extra obligation under that memorandum. It's not a treaty, but it did accomplish an enormous a return of nuclear weapons, consolidation of nuclear weapons left over from the Soviet Union. We need to reject linkage or trade-offs in which we look the other way while Russia does what it wants to do with Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, while we try to strike agreement in Syria. This is something Putin exploits and something we should not engage in. We should provide Ukraine with as much diplomatic support as possible, and we should never recognize the annexation of Crimea. We in the United States never recognized the absorption of Baltic states into the Soviet Union, and it took decades for those three states to become independent once again, and to not long after that join the European Union and NATO we should take the same approach, hopefully, in a much shorter period of time toward Crimea. We should shift from being reactive in dealing with Putin to being proactive and preemptive. All too often over the years, we've let Putin set the agenda. We need to try to prevent him from moving against his neighbors, moving further into the Middle East, and cracking down on his own people. If necessary, and this would require cooperation with the European Union, we should expel Russia from the SWIFT banking system. We should ramp up sanctions to higher levels, including, I would argue, to the richest man in Russia, Mr. Putin himself. We should go after corruption in Russia. The FIFA investigation is a terrific means by which to find corruption, not just in Russia, but where Russian corruption has facilitated corruption elsewhere. Putin's greatest export is corruption. But in order to export corruption, we have to import it. We need to do a better job 
cleaning up our own systems, of looking in the mirror and making sure that what we see is something we can live with every day. We need to support fact-based journalism, not counter-propaganda. That's a losing campaign. But to make sure factual journalism gets into Russia and into the populations along Russia's borders. Counter-propaganda isn't a game we want to play. But supporting real journalism is something we should do whether Russia was engaging in propaganda or not. We should expand outreach to the Russian people. This is something Catherine and I have been talking about before. We should not give up on the Russian people. There are tremendously good, decent Russian people. Not everyone is like Putin. So we have to distinguish between when we talk about the Putin regime versus Russia as a whole. There is a, a, a difference. There are people inside Russia who want a better future for their country and we need to stay engaged with them and to support them. We need to find innovative ways to support Russian civil society and NGOs, the foreign agent law that was passed, the undesirable foreign organization law. Putin and the Kremlin are trying to do everything to close off Russian civil society from the outside world. In which case, we need to be more creative in coming up with ways to support Russian civil society. In many cases, without our support, they will go out of business. You have a parliamentary election coming up in this fall. You may have heard in the United States, we have a presidential election as well. It's a bit of a crazy time right now in the United States, to be perfectly honest with you. But depending on who might win, I expect that there will be a tougher line from a new president, whether Republican or Democrat, unless it's Donald Trump, Toward Russia. It's not right. He's neither a Republican or a Democrat. Uh, and I, I do think that there will be more support for the other countries in the region, including your country. This is something that I think we desperately need to demonstrate to Mr. Putin that we are paying attention, that we're not taking our eye off the ball by either our internal situation problems in the Middle East, or a pivot or rebalance, whatever word you want to use, toward Asia. We need to engage more with Georgian civil society. We need to help you through your ongoing transition. Your elections are really important. You have demonstrated on numerous occasions your ability to conduct free and fair elections to have, and to have a peaceful transfer of power. Don't take that for granted. And make sure that you hold your political leaders accountable. The NATO summit in Warsaw this summer is going to be very important. Together, your country and NATO member states, including my country, need to come up with ways to demonstrate progress toward the goal that was enunciated in 2008 in Bucharest in which NATO said Georgia and Ukraine will become members of NATO. If it's not through a membership action plan, we need to come up with another mechanism to demonstrate, first and foremost, to Georgians that we in NATO remain supportive of your aspirations. But it's also a signal to send to Moscow to let Mr. Putin know that he will not deter us from welcoming nations that meet the criteria and standards for joining the Euro-Atlantic community. Staying on the democratic path is the best way for Georgia to move forward. It's the best way to get more attention and support from the West. And that then puts the burden on us in Washington, in Brussels, Berlin, and elsewhere to do everything we can to help you against the threat from Mr. Putin. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you very much, David, for this very comprehensive, deep, and passionate um, overview and analysis of um, Russian domestic problems and uh, challenges to the region it poses. Um, before opening the floor, 
I would like to use my prayer, which is the moderator, and ask you a question which is actually related to today's news. And this is the lifting of sanctions on Iran, because as many in this region consider this uh, event to be kind of a challenge to Russia's um, dominance on energy market. But on the other hand, Moscow seems to have done everything to contribute to this lifting and supporting them. So do you think that there is kind of a contradiction or it's just a single one? So how do you explain it? Uh, to be honest, I, I think Russia's role in the negotiations on the Iran nuclear deal were exaggerated. Um, they did not play an unhelpful role. But at the end of the day, these negotiations came down between the United States and Iran. Um, and Russia had a choice to either play the role of spoiler, which it's quite good at, or to essentially stay on the sidelines, facilitate somewhat. And I would argue they chose the latter. They chose not to be the spoiler in this case. But you're absolutely right that the lifting of sanctions and the production of Iranian energy and the delivery of it, export of it, is not going to help Russia's economy. And as Catherine mentioned, the price we heard earlier today, uh, uh, oil barrel of oil is to $28. The Russian budget was predicated on a figure of $50 a barrel. This is, this is not good news for Moscow. The ruble was down today. Uh, we shouldn't get too wrapped up in one day's uh, news but overall, I think the lifting of sanctions with Iran is not helpful, but it also may explain in part, not only, but in part why Russia's now moved into Syria since the end of September. Um, if it can't get its way in Iran, it will try to get its way in Syria perhaps instead. Oh, there you go. Um, um, so, um, I'm not sure I completely agree about Russia being in, in con well, not certainly not inconsequential in the um, negotiations with, with Iran. I think they were quite helpful. Um, but um, I don't think that the lifting of sanctions on the sale of Iranian oil will right away affect Russia. Um, and certainly they weren't, uh, Russia, the Russians were not anticipating oil prices being so low. But Iran will, it will take Iran a while to get its, uh, its pumping ability back online. It hasn't been online for 15 years. The infrastructure has apparently not been attended to. So that, that will, there'll be a lag effect. Um, the problem really with oil prices is Saudi Arabia anyway. And um, Iran won't be a major producer able to shift the oil price dramatically um, for quite some time, if at all. But it does open a market to Russia, and I think this is important because uh, Russia, you know, the, the world's largest purveyor of weapons is the United States. The second largest purveyor of weapons is Russia, um, and Iran is a market um, now for those weapons quite openly. The other issue, I think, concerning Iran is Syria, um, and uh, like Russia, Iran is, is back backing the Assad regime, um, and Iran uh, may need Russia's support. Um, in uh, dealing with Saudi Arabia um, as well, um, since, since that uh, conflict between regional powers is, is beginning to heat up there. So there are opportunities with Iran being brought back in, which is, I think, Russia's interest in having been involved in the negotiations in the first place. So it's not necessarily all bad for Thank you so much. Now I open the floor for questions from the audience, please. So the front row, please, first. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming in the very informative presentation. And I would like to ask uh, okay, uh, that uh, we know that uh, in the history we can name a lot of examples when a uh, leader died and uh, uh, the empire fell. Uh, so uh, Putin knows this and everybody almost knows this. So what, what is your personal view, what he is doing to um, somehow keep the country as it is now? Thank you. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. So I have kind of the question of uh, the comment. So we heard one theory from you that uh, when Russia 
kind of the gets weaker, uh, the risks for the countries, for neighboring countries, kind of the gets higher, like for Ukraine or Georgia. But we also have another survey that says that when Russia gets stronger, it uh, becomes kind of more assertive. Uh, so we have different theories with the same outcomes. Yes. So mm, uh, I, 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 as a citizen of Georgia, ask the question: Which scenario is kind of more uh, kind of uh, the interesting or more mm, kind of the good for us? Whether Russia becoming stronger or Russia becoming weaker? Uh, what, what is kind of your kind of the prognosis of that or explanation of this question? Uh, you mentioned uh, factual-based journalism and uh, anti-propaganda or counter-propaganda. Uh, in my opinion, the most, perhaps the most uh, effective uh, weapon of Russia uh, is, besides uh, military intervention, has been uh, propaganda and it's specifically its army of trolls, uh, which has been described as Ministry of Truth. Um, so I, I think that, and the two, I, like bring the audience back up on it. It's a, 20, it's a mega department in Saint, Saint Petersburg that works 24 hours and uh, specifically gets paid to go on uh, Western uh, websites and such and to comment pro uh, Putin uh, uh, ideas. Uh, so the only way basically to control that would be censorship. So do you think that would be uh, uncalled for to use censorship in this space, or do you think that there is any other way uh, of combating it? Thank you. Sure. I'll, um, I'll leave that third one to you on journalism, David. Um, I think the first question you were asking was what has Putin done to um, Sort of consolidate a system? Is that what you're asking? And if, yeah. if he were to die, what would happen? Keep things yeah, going? Because we, I think that uh, both, many of us both uh, can share this opinion that uh, the uh, system is based on uh, the leader power, mm -hmm. and if the leader power will somehow disappear in one day, so we mm -hmm. have a problem. Who will be the leader? Who will maintain right. the system as it is? Because they want to maintain the system as it is. So I think that, that much has been done in the last two or three years to, well, really since 2012 and, and Mr. Putin coming back, almost since the fall of 2011, I guess, when he announced uh, to Dmitry Medvedev's surprise that he was coming back as, as president and Medvedev would get to be prime minister again. Um, so um, I think they've worked a lot even more on Mr. Putin's sort of cult of personality, um, if you will. Uh, did some of you see this uh, this show called President well, in the spring of uh, last year? Uh, you can watch it on YouTube. I don't know if you want to spend a lot of time watching it. Um, but it's really a celebration. It was built as a celebration of Mr. Putin's 15 years of public service. So it, it's very it, it, it's very reminiscent of kind of Soviet style cult of personality, although there are no statues yet, right? Um, and there's a lot of focus on him personally. However, um, there is a, a, a line of thought that, um, in fact, elites are a little more fractured um, than it, it would seem, um, and that Mr. Ivanov, for example, is is somebody who you know could be uh, a potential successor um, to Putin. Has the same sort of background. Um, Perhaps it's not as frankly intellectually uh, uh, able as Mr. Putin. I mean, you can say many things about Vladimir Putin, but uh, he's not stupid. He's not necessarily particularly sophisticated. Um, but um, um, and he's definitely reactive and emotional. Um, but he's a, he's able to keep facts as he knows them in his head. And um, so I, it, I'm not sure that Ivanov is his equal in that respect, but certainly has has other similar capabilities, in, including this. Um, security background. Um, so, you know, I think there are people like that um, who are available. Um, uh, whether or not Mr. Putin wants to encourage them, particularly now, uh, I, I think the answer is no. Uh, you know, he, he wants to, to um, be in control. That's different than, say, 2010 or 2009. So I do think the global economic uh, 
disorder of 2008 and 9 um, affected him um, and um, his desire for a legacy. I do think that there was a real interest on his part in uh, leaving the presidency in, in 2008. Um, but it turns out Dima disappointed him, and, and so he, you know, had to come back and and, um, and save what he had built. Um, the the question that you asked, which is really interesting, about um, does Russia's relative degree of aggression depend on economics, basically, right? So is it more aggressive when it's strong or weak economically? Well, we have actually some nice, not, uh, it's a nice natural laboratory. In the 1990s, Russia was very, very weak economically. And um, I don't think if the opportunity to take Crimea had presented itself to Boris Yeltsin, that he would have done it. Um, I'm pretty sure he wouldn't. Uh, he had many, many faults, but I don't think he would have gone on that uh, kind of, um, he wouldn't have taken that chance, nor would he have gone into Donbass with the Russian military, certainly as it was then. Um, not that he wouldn't have agreed that Crimea was naturally part of Russia, um, but um, he, he wouldn't have, have used the, the scarce resources Russia had at the time to do that. So um, would, would he have gone into um, Georgia in 2008? No, I don't think so either. He, of course, had, felt he had to go into Chechnya, and that's more defensible, um, because that was obviously within Russia's borders, and there was a, a domestic terrorism issue at that time. Um, so, um, we haven't seen Russia poor like that again, um, and, and there is still a lag effect of incredible wealth and the projection of power, right? So, um, what uh, I have learned in the last month and a half to two months from visitors who've come to Stanford from the Russian government and then also being in Moscow last week is that you would think Syria um, and putting putting you know these planes in Syria and um, re-establishing this old Soviet base would have cost a lot of money um, and a, is a big drain on the budget. But in fact, it's negligible. It's it's practically nothing. It hasn't hit the Russian budget. Um, the, this is using money that was already planned uh, for the military. So it, it, you know we haven't seen Russia poor um, um, yet. Uh, it's we're anticipating it being poor. We, we know these numbers are all going to hit their budget. Um, but relative to where they were, they're still relatively speaking rich. So I don't think we can say yet that a poor Russia is an aggressive Russia. Um, I left it as a question. Um, I think the other thing is when you think about power, it isn't just military and wealth. I mean, that's kind of a, if international relations students are in the room, that's a very realist view of power. Right? But there are all kinds of other ways of projecting strength. Um, one of the things that Russia has, of course, is tremendous um, domain of, geographic domain of its influence. It has so many borders, um, and it can affect so many countries, rich or poor, right? And, I mean, regardless of whether Russia is rich or poor. Um, as a Canadian, our prime minister, former prime minister, the, the father of the current prime minister, um, Pierre Trudeau said in the 1970s rather infamously about the United States and its relationship to Canada, um, living, you know, living next to the United States for Canada is like sleeping with an elephant. Every time it rolls over, we get crushed. Um, and it seems to me that for many uh, bordering states uh, of Russia, it's the same sort of thing, right? And Russia rolls over and potentially the Georgian or Ukrainian economy uh, gets crushed, or at least hurt. Um, you, know, you guys are in a better situation, though, than many other post-Soviet states in that you do have alternatives, right, in terms of getting your, your oil and gas um, from other neighboring countries, not necessarily just from Russia. So I think we haven't seen Russia poor again. This is all anticipating Russia being poor and Russia having less money. Um, where it might, it, it has long-term bad prospects, and that's probably good news for Georgia. Because um, it, it can't, I mean, if, if it continues on this trajectory of underinvestment uh, in human capital in particular, and if oil prices are low, um, and if it doesn't diversify its economy, then it can't um, be as influential, it can't project um, that domain, uh, around that domain of power quite so much anymore. Um, and that's because its scope of power, the areas where it can interfere um, with your economy or with your politics, um, they won't be able to finance. Currently, they can finance it. 
um, I think in 2018, when they have their presidential election, um, and if they're out of money um, in the sovereign wealth fund, then after 2018, you're gonna to start to see a very different Russia um, that may become uh, more withdrawn rather than more aggressive. Just quickly on the Putin question. Uh, if Putin were to drop dead tomorrow, the system is not going to change overnight. This is a rotten system that has been inculcated with this anti-Western propaganda, um, and there are bad people around Putin. So what comes after Putin could be as bad, possibly even worse, but at the end of the day, that is beyond our control. It is not an argument to work with Mr. Putin to prop him up and keep him in power. That too is beyond our control. I think a mistake of the reset policy, one of the mistakes, I've been quite a strong critic of it, is we thought we could tip the balance in favor of Mr. Medvedev over Mr. Putin. And that was obviously wrong. So we should not pretend that we have a lot of influence over the internal political situation, we should stick with our principles, stand with those Russians who want a more democratic future, and stand with Russia's neighbors as much as possible. On uh, the question about propaganda and censorship, having been the president of Freedom House, I don't support censorship in general. And the problem is not the message, the problem is the messenger. It's where it's coming from. It's the Kremlin, it's Mr. Putin, it's, it's Mr. Kisilyov, and, and these, these aren't journalists. These are hate mongers who endanger people's lives by describing opponents and critics as uh, uh, fifth estate, as, as enemies of the state. And so, what I would prefer to do, rather than closing them off because of what they say, I would first agree with the EU, which put Mr. Kisilyov on its uh, sanctions list, but then I would close them down, not again because of what they say, but because of how they're funded. And, and what's the way to do that? There were two court rulings that came out in 2014. The Hague Arbitration Court ruled in favor of UCO shareholders in the amount of $50 billion, and the European Court of Human Rights came out, same uh, issue, UCOS, for $2 billion. Russia has refused to comply with either ruling. It's $52 billion, which even by Russian standards is a lot of money. RT, Sputnik, these are Russian government-funded agencies. Close them down, seize their assets, because this helps enforce rule of law, it helps enforce the verdicts that should be recognized by the international community. Again, it's not because of what they say, but you can't seize an embassy, you can't seize a diplomatic residence, but you can seize something like RT assets. It doesn't deal with the trolls in St. Petersburg, but one step at a time. So let's go for the next and last round of questions, please, in the first round. Please. Well, thank you for the presentation, but maybe I think it's more a pleasure for Mr. Cromer because you know, partly answer this that I would like to ask you. So we were thinking about support of civil uh, society in Russia and Georgia, thinking about Georgia. It's important to support, but for us it's more important now to see that the West understands that it has enemies in Georgia. What I mean? While supporting civil society, we have to see that you see and refuse support of uh, those uh, politicians, or those party members, leaders, and even governmental bodies who are openly declaring and building their political development on the anti-Western propaganda. Open. And on the next day, when we see their speeches, and or hear their speeches, we see uh, we always watch them beside the embassy of the United States, France, or maybe there. So just what I mean. Is it possible somehow to find any other structured, uh, structured methodology to identify those people, those people are identified, and refuse 
them from the Western support. It will be more impressive and more supportive for our society to understand who is a friend and who is an enemy, rather than supporting and even financially supporting the first of the civil society. Thank you. Am I clear? Thank you for the question. Uh, uh, my name is Becca Kirby, working at the Ministry of Defense of Georgia. The question goes to Mr. Kramer. Uh, I'm interested about your conversation. You spoke about like unity of Europe and Western uh, West uh, against the against the Russia and the termination of crippling annexation of Georgia and Ukraine from Russian side. So I have a question about recent initiative of China, which was referring to Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. And we see that UK was the first country who rushed up to this agreement. Uh, so how do you think these two, like unity of Western Bank against Russia, and you know, other times we see like they rush towards the Chinese initiative? Thank you. Um, it, it is tricky for the U.S. Agency for International Development or the State Department to pick and choose which organizations it wants to work with. That said, there's almost something ironic about providing assistance to anti-Western parties or organizations. We tend not to provide much support to parties directly. Um, but uh, because if they're bashing the United States, how could they possibly take assistance from us? It exposes the hypocrisy of such individuals and organizations. But there's also limited resources. So I, I take your point that it's better to target the resources for organizations, entities that are trying to promote a democratic path. Again, it gets tricky, but there are means of identifying forces that are trying to move the country in the right direction um, and not working for other outside forces, if you will. Um, on uh, the issue of unity of the West, the, you know, the United States was one of the only countries that came out against the China-led bank, and that didn't work too well. Um, so China is a different challenge for the, the international community, for the, for the United States as well. We have sanctions against Russia, thanks to the US Congress, which passed by a huge bipartisan majority, what I'm sure you know is the Magnitsky legislation, which is sanctions against Russian officials involved in gross human rights abuses. It denies them visas and it freezes their assets. We have not implemented it very aggressively, but we have this legislation for Russia specifically. In the US Congress, there is now consideration of taking that Magnitsky legislation for Russia and making it global. The US Senate has already passed its version of it. The US House of Representatives, I'm told, will consider this in a few weeks. I will be surprised if this legislation is applied to China. We hold China to a different standard. We're afraid of challenge, and, and by we, I mean not just the Obama administration, this has been true Republican and Democrat administrations. We just are afraid, or what, what, reluctant maybe is a better word, to challenge China on human rights. And yet when we do, we do seem to produce results, like getting a lawyer at least out of prison, although his sentence is suspended and he uh, has had his license re revoked. We underestimate our ability to push back on authoritarian regimes. We're always nervous about what they might do. Let's make them nervous about what we might do, including applying global Magnitsky legislation against gross human rights abuses, whether they're in Moscow, Beijing, Pyongyang, or you name it. Well, Baku, I'm sorry to say. Um, so I was just um, the other day looking at this new report on the Heritage Foundation on um, the U.S. policy towards Russia, and there is this kind of a blank statement that 
uh, after uh, the post-call uh, Russia has not been given any comprehensive strategy from the United States. Do you think this is true? And if it's true, has Ukraine case changed this little bit? And we know the Georgia is so Russia is Georgia. But has Ukrainian case uh, changed this? And is there a kind of comprehensive strategy from the US, US side in place of the year? I think we've had more than one strategy. We've had strategies, um, but none um, particularly well executed. So actually, I, um, I, I um, edited a book with um, a former ambassador to Russia, Michael McFaul, before he went into government on comparative democratic transitions that came out in 2010. And we talk about the influence of foreign versus domestic factors in successful transitions and failed ones. And so when we, when we I, I wrote the chapter on um, the Soviet Union, which we, we code as a successful transition from uh, autocracy, but it's an unsuccessful, Russia, an unsuccessful transition to democracy. Um, and the role, when we look at the role of foreign and domestic factors, and it turns out, um, you know, in terms of foreign policy, so this is relatively fresh in my mind, all that to say. In terms of foreign policy in the 1990s, you know, I think we, we gave Boris Yeltsin, we perceive we gave him a lot of support. But a lot of it was rhetorical support. Um, it wasn't financial support. The US was not the biggest donor to Russia. Uh, Germany was, um, and biggest investor. Um, and you know the, the amount that we actually gave through USAID and our other programs was really quite small. Um, so we didn't really put our money where our mouth was. And then I think what happened under the Bush administration initially was that uh, we thought Russia was done um, after uh, 2000. It looked like uh, it was you know, transiting um, toward a, a much more liberalized regime. Sure, it had problems, but if you go back and look, there are a number of papers written by economists and political scientists that called Russia a quote-unquote normal country. Um, and normal in the sense that it looked, was starting to look like Mexico. Um, and you know, with crony capitalism, sure, we rule of law, sure, but moving along in a positive way. Um, there were concerns about Mr. Putin, but the Putin that we saw between 2000 and 2003 is quite different from the Putin that you start to see by 2007, and he gives the unit speech, which is much more aggressive um, with respect to uh, international affairs. So I think, though, what happened in, in the United States and our policy becomes more and more inconsistent is, of course, 9-11-2001. And I think people who live outside the United States should never forget how uh, determinative that became of US foreign policy. Uh, we would not probably be in the situation in the Middle East that we are in now, if not for 9-11-2001. The US was attacked on its own soil, 2,000 civilians died, um, right, right into the Pentagon. Um, and of course, the World Trade Center. So um, that really determines our foreign policy, and I think Mr. Bush, sees Mr. Putin at that point as an ally. He's the first foreign leader to call and express his condolences. And this is, it, Bush is a, doesn't seem like a squishy guy, I guess, but uh, this meant something to him. And you remember the infamous comment that he made that he, he looked into Mr. Putin's eyes and saw his soul. Um, your boss saw KGB, right, in <laughs> three letters. Um, but, um, so, so there was this sort of bromance for a while, if you will, um, between the two of them. But it, it petered out partly because we became, I think Mr. Mr. Um, Bush was sort of uh, happy with NATO expansion and would have gone farther um, with it even um, had our European allies not said, no, 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 no don't do that. Um, but it also, uh, I think Russia um, became more and more threatened by NATO expansion. Um, the Bush administration, led by one, you know, in the foreign policy area on Russia, led by one of my colleagues, and, and I should say I'm a Democrat, she's a Republican, but we still somehow are friends, an odd couple. Uh, Connie Rice was very, she, she, was, she did have a very Cold War uh, view uh, of Russia. Um, and, um, you know, I think gradually Russia began to fulfill that stereotype in, in her mind as well, becoming you know, uh, sort of more paranoid, if you will, or, or uh, about uh, the U.S.'s intentions. Um, 
But we also became distracted by Iraq and the Middle East, um, and then it became very inconsistent. Uh, and so Russia went from being our friend to being our frenemy to being uh, ultimately, it seems now, our, an enemy. And as you mentioned, uh, as some of our military leaders thinking of it as, a, as an existential threat. Um, one of those is uh, Phil Breedlove, who is uh, U.S. Uh, commander, of NATO for commander of U.S. forces in NATO, I guess, and NATO supreme commander. Um, is is they call him in Russia um, General Breed Hate uh, because he's so anti-Russian. Um, and uh, you know these fears are now seeming to become a self-fulfilling prophecy with with respect to to Russia, U.S. relations, and uh, and NATO. So. I think we've been, to sum up, we've been, we've been inconsistent. Part of that inconsistency has been, you know, it has come from 9 11 and the impact that had on, on US foreign policy as well. But obviously, downgrading the importance of Russia in international affairs because uh, we began to think of Russia as a relatively poor country, perhaps developing but poor, and therefore inconsequential. And I think even uh, a poor Russia is consequential in international affairs, and, and we need to remember that. And I'm sure you here in Georgia have that very firmly in your minds. Thank you so much. And now we are going to the last part of our event, which is that um, in recognition of uh, both of our speakers' work, uh, both academic and uh, um, also, uh, in terms of the promotion of democracy in the region, um, uh, also for the work which uh, helped us to see the um, uh, political processes deeper and uh, also to acknowledge the um, um, acknowledge what was going on not only in Russia but also in wider Eurasian region. The Ilya State University has decided to award both of them an honorary doctorate, so now we can conduct a ceremony of this. Uh,